Many, if not most, art historians and scholars have briefly pursued a career in art, but few have persevered. How difficult is it to be both a scholar and an innovator? Is one more challenging, rewarding than the other? Which one? What? Oh, well, it, for me, the concept of being artist and scholar went hand in hand from the very beginning because I had a mentor who did that. I mentioned James A. Porter. He was a painter. He was a scholar. And when I went to Howard University in the fall of 1949, unannounced, uninvited, and just uh, showed up. Showed up. My teacher said, go to college, and so I went to college. And when getting there, three weeks late, and walking in saying, I'm here to go to college, and he said, you don't just come to college. You, you have to make an application. School is in progress. And I said, well, I'm here. Give me the application. They didn't know what to do with me, you know. And so I had that kind of passion from day one that I I had to make a difference. I had to do something very special. And so this whole notion of uh, how difficult is it and, and do you, uh, how do you line yourself up? Well, I had no, the, what I had was a, a model in front of me. And I thought everybody had to follow a model. And so there were no questions, no problems. I was going to be like James Porter. That's right. And so he took great pride in the fact that I tried to be like him. He would come to our house to visit to see what I was doing. And when he would leave the classroom, I'd get up and continue his lecture, trying to even talk like him. Yeah. And the kids would laugh and so forth. So, but it was my passion. So from day one, I knew. Now, I went to college as a history major. And the same James A. Porter came in the classroom when I took my first drawing course with James Wells, which was a year and a half into my college studies. And he just happened to be walking through, saw me drawing one day. And he said, what is your name? I said, David Driscoll. He said, I haven't seen you here before. He said, are you not major? What is your major? I said, no, I'm a history major. And he said, well, you don't belong over there. You belong here. And so I went and changed my major. So from day one, in the sense of my art experience, I had this model that I was following. So it has been difficult. It hasn't been easy. First of all, you know how difficult it is to be an artist, period. You don't get that much encouragement. Your family will encourage you, a few people here and there, your professors, but you don't get too much otherwise. And so I started out with the notion that I just had to be successful. And so by my third year in art, a junior, I was given the chance to come to the Skowhegan School of Painting and Sculpture. I received, Howard had a scholarship for one student each summer. The school had been founded in 1946 here in the state of Maine uh, by four painters. And, uh, and, and I had heard about it and the kids who had gone ahead of me and Howard had a scholarship from day one at the school because they wanted the school integrated well, from the very beginning. Mm -hmm. And Lois Jones was a principal in making sure that those students went there every year. And so when I was invited to come in 1953, the school was six years old. And I came, Henry Varnum Poor was one of my teachers, uh, Jack Levine, and, mm -hmm. and 
So I came with this passion, oh, I'm going to be a social commentary artist. I studied with Jack Levine. Well, that didn't work. You know, I soon learned that that was not my calling. I came here and I saw the beauty of this state and I said, wow, the landscape, the trees, they don't talk back, mm -hmm. you know. And I can do what I want with that. And so I all but became a landscape painter with the beauty of, of this place. And I went back home and I told my wife, Thelma, I said, you know, all famous artists go to Maine in the summer. They either have homes or they go up there to teach. And I said, and someday we've got to have a home. We've got a studio or something in Maine. Well, we didn't even have a home there. But I was dreaming. And the dream came true that eight years afterwards, we bought a little shack in Maine mm -hmm. and, and took what we had and built and made what we wanted. And so from that, uh, I knew I had to do, it had to be a duality of study and creativity. And so they went hand in hand. But I don't think it's something that everybody has the uh, calling to do, the determination, or as my mom used to say, the stomach <laughs> uh, to do. It, it requires a lot of sacrifice, a lot of time, a lot of emphasis, a lot of pursuit. And people really are not always that encouraging when you're trying to do both. They will tell you, why don't you just concentrate on this? Why don't you do that? And in, in particular, in academia, it is not a characteristic of the European American world to be doing several things. There's specialization that's going on. When I came to the University of Maryland, I could have taught any course in the curriculum because I had taught them before at Talladega, at Howard, and later, you know, and at Fisk. I had to teach primmic, and I had to teach ceramics, I had to teach uh, um, history, I had to teach art education. You have to do it in the historically black colleges and universities. There's nobody else to do it. But when I came to, Mar to Maryland, I was a very strange creature because I taught art history and studio. Mm -hmm. And of course, it was to my advantage because when I became chairman, I could look over everybody's shoulders. <laughs> and I could see, is this what should be done? And I was conversant with them. 